Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about strategies to improve your margin dollars from your direct mail. And I wanted to introduce um, our speaker today and presenter, Kevin Naughton. Kevin is the owner and president of Printcom. He has over 25 years of experience in direct mail marketing and over 40 years of experience here in the printing industry. Um, so he is our industry expert. Kevin, I will turn it over to you. Okie doke. Thanks a lot, Kelsey. Thanks everybody for showing up today. Hope we can uh, provide you with some uh, information that'll be useful, improving your uh, direct mail efforts. Uh, we're going to focus a lot on data today, a little bit on offers. We're going to start out talking about RFM, uh, which is an acronym for recency, frequency, and monetary to define segments. Uh, we'll get into some strategies for selecting the right customers. Um, talk a little bit about how to uh, different segments respond to retention mailings, uh, maybe some offer strategies for the various segments, and uh, how to reduce churn. It's uh, hard to get customers, so you don't want to lose them. And then some, some thoughts on uh, cross-sell and upsell uh, opportunities. Um, we're really going to focus a lot on retention type mailings today. We'll, we'll touch a little bit on reactivation and acquisition as they kind of correlate with that. Okay, so I guess the big question right out of the gate, why retention mailing? Well, um, because it's the form of mail you're going to make the, more money, the most money from. Uh, I see ROI to retention segments regularly. Uh, running between 250 and 600%, and that's based on margin, not sales. So to be playing, that would be taking, uh, the calc for that would be taking the cost uh, of the outbound mail and uh, dividing it into the margin dollars. Uh, and uh, most clients look at margin after uh, promotional cost. In other words, the cost of the offer is subtracted subtracted so the margin is just the net margin so it can be pretty high, high ROI um, you know, by contrast and I guess this is another big compelling argument for direct mail email open rates range from 12 to 29 percent I mean occasionally I hear somebody that's got open rates in the 40 percent even if it gets up to 40 um, you know, there's still the majority of the customers that aren't being reached uh, via email. Had a conversation with a customer yesterday. I think the big challenge with the email nowadays, and, and I'm, I'm not bashing email. I think we should use every uh, every tool in the tool bag. But uh, it's it's gotten so overused that, uh, you know, many people who received are, are, are tuning it out. And, uh, you know, for sure, um, customers, 70 to 80% of customers probably are not reading the emails. So uh, direct mail is necessary to reach the folks that aren't opening the emails and, and also the folks that um, haven't even provided a valid email address. Um, this is a real compelling piece of information here. Our clients report that direct mail drives more margin dollars than any other channel. There may be some that have higher ROI percentages uh, from uh, other channels. Uh, but, um, you know, if you look at your income statement, um, typically the, the numbers that people care about are like net income and EBITDA and direct mail definitely drives more margin dollars than any other channel. Um, Having said that, that's at the sort of clients we work with. We're typically working with like retailers, uh, e-tailers, um, and franchisors that uh, have a retail network. So within that space and the people that direct mail is a good fit for, uh, direct mail drives more do margin dollars than in any other channel. Um, and I guess another way you can look at it, acquisition campaigns, you know, the metric there uh, that typically matters is cost per acquisition. But frankly, most acquisition campaigns uh, are not ROI positive. 
And so the margin dollars you make off of uh, retention can actually provide funds, you know, to, to subsidize the acquisition effort. Okay. Um, I should mention, Kelsey uh, will be fielding questions throughout the session here today. So if you have a question, just to shoot a chat message um, off to Kelsey and we'll, uh, she'll let me know we've got some and we'll stop for a minute and uh, answer them. Okay. So what do we mean by retention mail? I, I'm just throwing some definitions out here so, so we're all kind of aligned. It's, it's really a broad term to describe mailings that go to active uh, customers. And, it, you know, the, the, the objective certainly can be broader uh, than just trying to retain the customer. Uh, it can include things like uh, onboarding uh, for new customers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, cross sell or upsell uh, is another objective. Uh, return shopping, uh, which is certainly aligned with retention. And then um, triggered mailings, which have become more and more popular as people's data uh, gets better in their ability to you know, create campaigns or algorithms that spit out people that meet uh, certain conditions. Uh, based on lifestyle triggers or certain behaviors of those sort of things. Triggered uh, mailings to uh, customers are, are becoming more and more popular. Okay, so um, another big question is how do you select the right customers? Um, and by right, we mean the customers who will spend the most money and generate the highest margins. That's the big objective, right? You want to pick the ones you're going to spend the most money. There can be some sub objectives like, okay, we want to reduce churn. Like we need to find a way to uh, stop losing customers. The longer we hang on to them, uh, the higher their lifetime customer uh, value becomes. But uh, the, the, big, the biggest objective is, you know, how can we get the most margins? And so selecting the right customers is, very important issue. Okay, so we'll talk about RFM a little bit um, and just kind of define that. Uh, so the R is recency. When was the last time they bought? Huge impact on results. Uh, frequency, how often do they shop or buy? Um, you know, this is, every business has some different characteristics here. You know, you've got so, you know, for instance, if you're like in the grocery business or the pet food business or something like that, people are going to shop, you know, very frequently versus if you're in the shoe business or something like that, they're not going to shop as frequently. So every business's metrics are a little bit different in this, this area. There, you know, it's no one size fits all answer here. The uh, third uh, variable monetary, how much do they spend for uh, what is their margin value? You could look at that either way. So you can use RFM to do uh, a couple different things. The first one is define customer segments, and we'll get into that a little bit deeper here in a second. And uh, the other thing is you can use it on uh, an individual level uh, for triggered predictive uh, offers uh, by analyzing purchase intervals and anticipating next purchase time. Now, I don't really get into this uh, too much in this session, but I will just say that timing is a giant impactor on performance. If the right offer shows up at the right time um, to the right person, then your chances for success are, are optimized. You can send the right offer to the right person and not at the right time, and it probably isn't going to work or work as well. So um, got this, uh, anybody knows me knows I love quadrants, right? Uh, and probably there's some of my team members uh, laughing in the background here, but you kind of look at this graphic over there on the right, there's two axes. There's a value axis and there's a frequency axis. 
And so the value axis, the horizontal axis, uh, moves from left to right, low to high. And then the frequency um, axis starts at low on the bottom and high frequency on the top. And so you see the four quadrants uh, represented by that. So now bearing that in mind, let's, let's talk about um, customer segmentation using RFM. So I call the A's, uh, the people in that upper right-hand corner, high frequency, high value. Uh, they shop often and uh, they have been in recently and they spend lots of money and generate lots of margin. Uh, the B's I would call the two shoulder segments. Um, so there's a couple different takes on that. If you look at that one in the upper left, it's high frequency, low value. The one in the lower right, low frequency, high value. Um, really what you're trying to do with those two segments, if you can, is move them up towards the uh, upper right-hand corner there. So if they're high frequency or low value, you're trying to increase the value uh, of that customer somehow. And if they're in the lower right-hand corner, they're high value but low frequency, you're trying to increase like frequency or items per transaction, okay? And so those kind of people, um, you know, you might target with offers that would incent them to come in more often or like that would be the case of the lower right quadrant or like in the upper left, you might try to, uh, you know, send some offers out that generate like additional uh, purchases somehow. Um, that's kind of some broad objectives. And then uh, I have a, another segment here uh, that's kind of a key segment. Uh, that isn't really represented by one of these squares, but I'm calling these at-risk customers. And these are customers who have fallen out of pattern. So let's just pretend I've got a customer that comes in every six weeks. I can, I can see that, you know, I've got algorithms that like help me see what their pattern is and who's outside of pattern. Um, those are people I really want to go after. We just did a study for a customer that was super interesting. And we were looking at like uh, estimated annual spend uh, for, uh, for their customers. And we actually divided uh, annual spend their customers up into deciles. So each 10% slice was... Um, you know, the first 10% were the biggest annual spenders and the second decile was the, the next highest group. And then we equated that with like uh, recency. And one of the things we found out, like a normal purchasing interval will kind of like average of that particular customer was about six weeks. And what we found was that once somebody had not been in, in about two months, like there was almost like a cliff effect where like, the annual spend like just dropped way off. And like, we all looked at that and it's like, okay, we were kind of considering it lapsed at like six or seven months before that, but we realized we need to start attacking these people at about eight weeks, like, because there's giant churn after eight weeks happened. And the number, the two month, three month number was like, a big drop off the three to four was a big drop off and then like really they, they go quiet past that point so this is a segment to like really look at the at-risk people and then we've got the c's which are the lower left so real world for a lot of retailers that can be over 50 percent of the people in your customer database and sometimes 60 or 70. these are low frequency low value uh customers and like our take is on a lot of these, you probably like don't spend a lot of money reaching them. You might do some tests to see how many of you can re, you know, reactivate that sort of thing. But if you've got a limited budget and you're looking for the highest margin and, and 
you know, ROI, then you probably want to ignore a lot of these people um, because you're going to spend a lot of money and it won't add up. So there are some other segments that fall outside of the uh, parameters of, of my quadrants here. Uh, there's a group that we call sporadic or promiscuous customers. They kind of shop all over the place and they pop in every once in a while and they don't really have any kind of pattern. So it's hard to, you know, put them, even put them in a frequency or value category. Uh, another segment is new. And like, this is a very important segment, new customers. Um, man, you want to, um, you want to really go after these people with onboarding programs that like are going to get them back shopping again and reduce the drop off between first and second visits. I mean, thinking about this. I've seen brands where their drop off is like 30 to 50 percent from one to two. In other words, the the number of purchasers, new customers that turn into second time purchasers can drop off like 30 to 50 percent. Man, if you can move that number to where you're only losing like 20 to 25. So so here's some math. If you have 50% loss between visit one and visit two, that means you really have a two year lifetime value. Okay. If, if you're churning them over, if you can take that number up to 25% loss, 75% uh, retention, now you're getting four years on average out of everybody. And the lifetime value is 4x the annual spend. So that is a giant issue because the the acquisition costs like did to acquire new customers continue to climb uh, as the, the marketing landscape gets more crowded. So like onboarding programs to keep these people coming back and buying more that that's a huge thing to think about. And then we've got this lapsed cat ca uh, category. Now, technically this is reactivation, not retention, but like I would encourage you not to ignore these. Uh, it's easier to win them back than to acquire a new customer. Um, you know, I see response rates and now we're talking percentages of percentages to be real here, but I see response rates in these like long time lapsed customers, you know, uh, about 50% higher than the acquisition rate. So they, they are, they are still cheaper than acquiring a new customer, you know, to, to land. Okay. Kelsey, just jump in if you've got a question. Just tell me to shut up for a minute and I'll stop. Will do, Kevin. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about strategies for selecting the right customers. Now, real world folks, this has to be done with, you know, pretty high end data practices. Uh, so, you know, real world, and this sounds weird from a company that does execution on direct mail, but it doesn't make sense to mail all your customers. The RI just won't be there. Uh, so, so how do you pick them? And so kind of the big broad encompassing thought is you're going to use data driven mar uh, targeting, uh, which involves analyzing the customer data so you can score the customers. Um, and so you're going to score them. There's, there's lots of ways you can score, but the, the, you know, the predominant ones are recency. Recency is huge. Recency has a giant impact on response. Uh, maybe it sounds like a no brainer once it comes out, but uh, if somebody has been to the store in the last month or the last three months, they're more likely to buy than somebody who hasn't been there for seven months. So like the last date of purchase, should be a giant impactor on who you pick. Uh, transaction history, like what do they buy, how often, how much do they spend, uh, how much margin accrues with them. Like margin matters, right? You've got some adult trick-or-treater types who just like respond to the freeze and the like super good deals and don't show up any other time. Um, so all that should be taken into account. Um, so you, you figure out what matters and you, you know, you can actually model, create a scoring model for customers uh, to pick the ones that are going to generate the greatest return. Um, here's another thought, and th this has to get tested. But there are people who are going to show up and buy without a coupon. 
And like, if you give them a coupon, you're just giving away margin and you're giving away part of your marketing spend that could be used to try to draw somebody else uh, back in to make a purchase. So this would be another thing to analyze. Consider who you don't need to mail to. Uh, you don't have to give them a coupon or offer to buy. They're going to come in anyway. This will help you, you know, spend your money, uh, you know, a little bit wiser. Okay. Talk a little bit about how various segments respond to retention mailings. And I kind of put these under three broad categories, most responsive, less responsive, lowest response. Um, the most responsive are the high value frequent buyers. Uh, they're really engaged. Uh, their response rates can be really high. Depends on, uh, we uh, like we've done uh, retail goods and we've done like auto service and like in the retail stuff, I mean, I, I see these response sometime like in the seven, eight, nine, 10, 11% range, depending on segment. And like in the auto service space, I mean, we used to see response rates in the 11, like double digits, like 11 high teens. Uh, auto service gets tons of data on your customers. So it, it, it makes it um, really practical to do time of need stuff. Uh, new customers, they're very responsive. Um, really think about nurturing mailings, bounce back offers. How can you get them back to store? And like nurturing, um, doesn't have to just be an offer. It might be like a note from the store manager or something like that, just welcome, welcoming them, you know, greeting type language, uh, appreciation express, that sort of thing. Uh, also in the most responsive are the at-risk customers. Um, if you catch them before they leave, you, they will be very responsive, but don't wait too long or they're gonna go cold, okay? Um, the less responsive are the infrequent buyers. Um, and some of them, you may have to throw offers out there that look pretty close to prospect offers to get them to change their buying pattern. Um, you know, recent, recently lapsed, they're going to be a little less responsive. The lowest response are the longer term lapse people. As I mentioned earlier, the response rates are still better than acquisition, and an acquisition obviously has the lowest response. I mean, you got to do acquisition. You need new customers to replace attrition. But um, like, I've seen markets where, you know, when you like look at the penetration, the customer addresses that you have versus the total addresses in that particular market, you know, there's very there in some cases, very high levels of penetration, especially like for very mature stores. Sometimes it makes sense to like, in some markets to focus more on reactivation than acquisition, because you really have already the most of the high quality people in your database. Okay, moving on here. Kevin, yeah. we have a question from Mary Lee here. How can we effectively combine RFM scores with customer lifecycle stages for more refined segments? Okay, give me a minute to think about this. Um, this is where it'd be nice to have some uh, um, mood music here. Um, well, you know, I would see like a new customer being uh, part of a life cycle stage, right? Um, and then I would see a uh, customer who's been with you for like year or two as another life ci uh, cycle stage. Um, so certainly duration of customer could be something that would impact a scoring model. Um, you know, there's other ways you can look at life cycle stage, right? Like from a demographic type standpoint. Um, almost like the way you'd look at like uh, personas, um, you know, uh, clusters, that sort of thing. So there, you can definitely uh, aggregate the thinking there. Like we've done customer scoring models, you know, for people where we did 
put in like uh, um, demographic. It, it wasn't just demographic. Some of it was psychographic too, but we're, we have like uh, segments based on ethnicity, gender, li uh, lifestyle, you know, like from the perspective of do they have children? Uh, do they, are they married or single? like age and then like, you know, income, uh, home ownership, those sorts of things where those can, those, those uh, traits can get appended to all of your customers and they can be used to assess how they impact the model. Um, does, does that answer the question? Um, I, I believe so. If, Mary Lee or anyone else, if you have additional questions based on that, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, you can use um, you can use lots of uh, outside demographic um, data, home ownership, uh, all kinds of things um, in your customer scoring models. Also, um, uh, I'll, I'll throw for instance out here. Let's say I'm into home services. Uh, I would certainly like want to contemplate like the age of home, the value of home, like probably the person's net worth, income producing assets, uh, those sorts of things uh, to really understand who like uh, was a fit. Like when you get, yeah, okay, that's probably enough on that. The, the answer is it, it, it can and should get looked at, you know, and how that happens varies based on what business you're in. Okay. Um, Okay, Kevin, I'll skip past this. Yeah, go Kevin, ahead. We have another question here from Evelyn. How can customers' feedback be integrated into RFM models to ensure we're selecting the right customers? Well, um, I'll, I'll throw a couple of uh, examples in here. Like, this is another piece of study or research that they can get done. But, like, channel preferences should be considered. Right. Like if any of you run a loyalty program and you ask people how they want to or not, how they want to be communicated or not communicated with. Um, that should be contemplated. Some people want direct mail. Some don't want it. Um, like if they don't want it, you know, like, if, you know, you should be keeping like a do not mail or a suppression um, file. Uh, like I see. Uh, some people do this with email. Perhaps it should be done with direct mail. How often do you want to be mailed? So I, I think it's thoughtful to uh, ask your your customers how they want to be communicated with and then um, integrate that um, into your customer data uh, so it can be uh, contemplated you know, when the selections are getting made. Does, does that answer the question or did you have something else you were thinking there? That seems to uh, have answered the question. And Evelyn okay, again. Yeah, we're gonna, okay, okay, thanks a lot, Evelyn. Uh, if you have any other thoughts or questions for, uh, related to like specific use cases or, you know, specific preference, they, you know, just shoot them over and, you know, we can comment on that too, okay. So let's talk a little bit about offer strategy. Should everyone get the same offer? Okay, how many of you think yes? And how many of you think no? There, there, there is a, uh, there's kind of a, uh, what's the right word here? There's schools of thought on this, right? Um, so we've done mailings before. And for those of you that do mailings, I'm sure you've done them too, where like, you got two people on the same street, neighbors, and they both get a direct mail piece. And one of them has one offer and another one has another offer. And one of them has a better offer. And the other one has a lesser offer. And like they get ticked off because like, how come you got a better offer than I did? Uh, well, um, so the reality is we don't craft offers to like, make everybody happy we craft offers that like get people to come buy stuff from us and the types of offers 
that we have to present to people on an individual level um, are going to be different. So this is the reality here. Current good customers typically get the lowest value offers from the standpoint of discounts or dollars off. This is where loyalty programs can kind of like prop up those folks. Um, you know, loyalty programs can allow people to accrue like points, things like that, earn freeze. And so your loyalty programs can be a way that like um, kind of mitigate some of the bitterness they might feel not getting the same offer as the person across the street who's only been there one time. Um, so, um, yeah, so, um, you know, there's offers and strategies to increase items per transaction or frequency of, of purchase. You can do this with loyalty points, buy one, get one at a discount, three, four, whatever, uh, a second coupon to stimulate another uh, visit that could be good on a certain future date. So, uh, you know, I'm a 60 something year old guy and, you know, I get targeted by these men's clothing companies uh, that want to sell you shirts for uh, 80 or 90 bucks. And they probably figured out I'm not going to spend 80 or 90 bucks on a shirt. So they'll send me an offer that's like two or three for like 150 or something like that. Um, that that kind of thinking that gets people to spend more and, and perceive that there's a better offer taking place. A uh, second coupon to stimulate another visit can increase frequency. Uh, Kohl's is famous for this. If you go into the store, uh, you check out, and they're going to give you a coupon. Okay, you can use this one starting on November 14th. Okay. Uh, if the customer is at risk of churn, then you might need to give them a, an offer that's a little bit richer than what your ace would get, but not as much as prospects. Um, so play and pretend here. Let's pretend you give your like really good customers 10 or 15 percent off. Uh, in that scenario, the risk of churn people might be like at 15 or 20, something like that. Um, when you get into acquisition, the offers really need to be predatory. Like my friend Frank says, like you got to get a give them a reason to like get off the couch and like come buy from you instead of like whoever they're buying from right now. Because uh, the goal is to win the customer. And I know like we do a franchise networks franchisers like I don't want to give give that much margin away. And it's like when you're doing acquisition, you just got to hold your nose and throw the discount out there and like get them into the store. And, uh, you know, you got to, this is where customer experience and, and retention and onboarding, all this becomes so high. Because if I'm going to spend a whole bunch of money to acquire a customer, then I need to keep them for a long enough time period to uh, justify that acquisition cost. But, okay, okay, and I have been doing this a while. And I'm going to tell you right now, the offers it takes to win customers are way better, richer, than they were even 10 years ago. Because the playing field is more uh, populated with people throwing out offers and, and I, it just kind of you know keeps creeping, creeping up and up and up. So the offers, they have to be big. Like I, I've seen lots of data to support that. Okay, so some considerations on offers. A one size fits all approach is gonna cannibalize your margin. You're going to uh, need really rich offers to attract prospects. You don't want to give those to current customers. Okay. This is one of the arguments against shared mail. Like shared mail, I throw it out there and everybody's getting the same offer. Like, so I'm given, I'm either given a middle of the road offer that won't attract the prospects but I'm given a really high offer to try to attract the prospects. But now I just like gave away a whole bunch of margin on the customers that were probably going to like shop 
with me anyway. So targeted allows you to be much more refined uh, in your offers where hopefully you're only giving the rich prospect offers to the prospects and not to your current customers. But that leads me right into point number two, which is like a giant issue. And notice the all caps there. I'm like yelling this one. This is a huge item to focus on. Good data hygiene is needed so you don't send those rich offers to customers. Those of you that are in e-com and you are shipping stuff to people, dude, you got like a giant leg up on people who aren't in e-com because you have to get the shipping address to be able to ship something to them. And it's probably gonna be the right address. But for those of you that are in more traditional retail, um, like sometimes they're scared to even ask for an email address because like people start getting weird at, weirded out when you ask them for info. So you gotta do really good data hygiene on the names you have and lots of, address of pen methods like we've done tons of this stuff here to try to help people build their address a, a database a database of physical addresses um and then you got to get like super creative uh sweepstakes entries giveaways you know like coupons that kind of thing people will give you info when you give them enough value perceived value so like you know, if you got a 19 year old store associate asking them for their address in the store, like a good chunk of the people are gonna say, no, thank you, I don't wanna do that. Uh, you're gonna have trouble even getting an email ad address out of a lot of them. But like if, let's say you get the email now in your emails, you do variable email and all the people you don't have a physical address on, you just uh, append a little promo that says, hey, register for our whatever sweepstakes. Um, uh, and provide us uh, with your address so we can mail you a certificate if you win. That, that's kind of the premise. So, so get creative like that. Building your database full of physical addresses is gonna help you reach more people with mail. And it's also gonna help you suppress customers from prospect mailings so you don't like cannibalize your margins. Um, huge deal. Like number three consideration offers, just keep testing. Uh, really, I think good retail marketers, e-commerce e marketers, like have a testing culture, like sit down at, like in Q4 and say, these are the things we are going to test every month. These are the things we'd like to figure out if they're going to work. And like, we're going to maybe do these by, we're going to prioritize them by potential impact. So like, here's the tests we're going to run out. You know, we'll always have a control group that gets the old and we'll try this, this new thing to see if it works better. Test, test, test. I know in a lot of uh, companies that are, you know, they're not big. Sometimes there's like almost a disincentive to uh, taking risk. It's kind of like, well, if we try something and it doesn't work, then, uh, you know, they're going to hate me and they're going to fire me. Like, so just do limited tests. And uh get buy-in to have a testing culture. Like, it'll make a huge difference. Okay, how to reduce churn. Let's talk a little bit about that. We have any any other comments or Kelsey, or are we gonna keep going? Kevin, we have a couple of uh, questions that have popped up. Uh, okay. The first one was just prior to offers, and that's how do we balance, the, this is from Dave, how do we balance the needs of high value customers with those of customers showing potential growth? Um, well, um, you know, probably the budget consideration is really going to end her into it. Right. And it's like, um, how much money is my company willing to allocate to direct mail? And probably once you have good success metrics, like they're willing to allocate more. And like if you work in a company with, uh, you know, a, where you're selling product, like you can probably get the product purveyors to like start kicking in money 
uh, they're going to win if you sell more. So you get, you know, your merchandisers can probably hit them up for some funds to help fund it. So like the budget's going to be a consideration. And then I would say once that's determined, you have to sit down and really think about what is the objective right now? Like is my objective to drive max, maximum sales? Is my objective to like try to win back more customers? Is my uh, objective to uh, try to move those shoulder segments towards upper right? So really, what is I? What is it that I really want to try to accomplish this month? I don't think you have the same month, week, quarter, whatever. I, I say month. What what really is the objective, and that will kind of drive the mix, right? Like some months, weeks, whatever you may elect to uh, mail to all of your A customers. And some months you may choose to like dial that down a little bit and push in a little bit harder on like those shoulder segments. So I would really say it's 100% driven by like what is the objective uh, for that particular uh, moment in time. Okay. That's great. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we have one more here from Mary Lee. And she's asking, how can RFM segmentation be used to re-engage customers with low recency scores without risking unsubscribes? Um, so we're talking, uh, we're talking email now, uh, which is fine. Um, well, I think in email, I think most people who are, uh, really skilled at doing email, uh, test segments of their email database. They, they, they take small segments and test like how frequency impacts unsubscribe. Like if we send them one a day, how much, what percentage unsubscribe? If we send them two a day, if we send them one a week, whatever, how does that impact purchase? And how does it impact unsubscribe? So the way I would suggest managing that is like taking a small segment of whatever segment you're talking about, some sub-segment, and like testing the approach and seeing what happens before you roll it out on a widespread basis. Like if it if an approach generates tons of unsubscribes, then like you you've tested it maybe on I'm just making this up 50,000 names instead of 5 million, you know, uh, so um, you, you haven't killed your whole mar marketing program figuring that question out. Does that make sense? Yes, that's great. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. How to reduce churn? Well, first of all, I think you need to define what constitutes a lapsed customer. And I would say most businesses don't really know this. Like this is a data point that needs to get analyzed. Uh, okay, I'll give an example here. Uh, and, I, and I make this case in the second bullet point. Risk of churn is really consumer specific because buying frequency varies by customer. So I always use this example, uh, me and my mother. Uh, my mother, she, uh, you know, she might put, I'm not kidding folks, 4,000 miles a year on a car. And I put 24,000. And so she needs like oil change service like once a year. And I need it like every three months. And so that's where I say uh, there, there might be a broad definition of what a lapsed customer is. Like, you know, that study I talked about early where like if they didn't come in in two months, you know, they, there was like a cliff effect. On the other hand, like really churn is a, a very individual thing. So like for me, um, when I get to the three month mark, if I'm, you know, a week or two past three weeks or three months, I should say, I'm at risk of churn versus my mom, like it would be dumb to mail her a piece every three months. Like she's not really at risk of churn until she, she gets out like past 12 months. 
So that leads me into the third point, which is you really need to develop models or algorithms to look at recency, frequency, and gap on an individual basis to determine who's at risk. And you notice I'm advocating for a lot of data science here. I can't remember the why it's like cooked up a stat one time of like how much, what percentage of the direct mail spend uh, gets allocated to data science by the people that are highly skilled at it. And my recollection was it was like in the two to three percent uh, range. So, you know, some some money spent on model development, analysis, ongoing testing on the front end will make the direct mail way more effective. Um, now, this this whole model algorithm thing for companies with frequent purchasers, they may want to look at more frequent triggered marketing touches that like onboarding should be triggered. Like, you know, you're basically throwing them into a marketing automation cadence that like, okay, purchase date plus whatever they get this, purchase date plus this, they get this. Um, risk of churn customers should be part of triggered sequences. Uh, like cross sell upsell, which we'll talk about in a minute, those should be part of triggered sequences. So like um, there are certainly people that should be part of episodic campaigns, like you can roll acquisition, a lot of your like steady customers into like episodic campaigns, like big giant mailings where you can really save a lot of money on postage and print costs because you're doing like lots of them all at the same time. Uh, but there's others that, that the whole risk of churn and some other factors uh, dictate, you know, triggered. Okay, cross sell and upsell. I, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but this is really uh, targeting based on purchase behavior. So there are algorithms developed that analyze purchases or current basket and use that data to promote suggested additional purchases. Like we probably all buy stuff from Amazon and they are the masters at proposing ideas on what we might like based on our previous buying history or what might be a complementary purchase to the thing we just, you know, bought. Like uh, I get stuff from a Johnston Murphy and they're like really good at this. Like you buy a sport coat or a pair of chucka boots and like they're throwing you out pictures of like pants and belts and shirts that go with it. So that's, that's the kind of thought process there. I will say, that is like high level use case stuff and requires some pretty extensive setup to associate, you know, the additional SKUs with the initial SKUs. You know, you, you really almost have to have like tables set up or like keywords, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, okay, so that wraps it up. You, you, or is there another question out there? We have one other question from Evelyn, and that's you kind of touched on a bit, but what strategies are most effective for upselling or cross-selling in segments that have high frequency of purchases, but a low average order value? Yeah, low average order value. I think the play is to just, instead of just sending them like a percentage off offer. Let me say this, this is a universal truth we've learned through the years. Multiple offers, always work better than one offer. So find a way to include multiple offers in your pieces. Um, now, aside from that, um, you know, the buy one, get one 50% off. The, you know, buy three, get the fourth free. You know, buy a, uh, you know, buy a book, get a free Kindle to go along with it. Like contemplate using offers that would get that person to buy another one or two or three items. It, it offer construction is going to be the key. Um, so let's just play pretend here. 
let's say you send out a direct mail piece and it's got two offers. Um, and they come in and they buy one thing. Like, I, you know, the, de de the degree to which you are, your, your company is able to mine its transactional data is going to be like huge in this. So it's like they buy this. We've set up tables on what could be next as far as complimentary, and we're blasting them an email, or we blast them an email first, and they don't respond like or open. Then we send them out a direct mail piece like two days later or something like that. We're going to give them 24 hours to open the email. If they don't, we're going to trigger them a, a direct mail piece. Uh, you know. You, you try to use email first because it's cheaper, and if it doesn't work, then then you spend the extra money. But th th there, there's three or four three, uh, three or four things there. Like I don't know if that's helpful or not helpful. Okay, um, we can take some more. Uh, give you some contact information here if you want to fire in more questions. Uh, everybody who showed up today has been entered in, into our drawing for the Amazon gift card. Uh, we're going to be emailing the winner this week. Um, okay. And uh, here's some potential next steps. Um, if any of these work for you, just let us know. Um, you could schedule a meeting with us to discuss any questions you have in your situation. Um, really kind of a discovery thing. You can, you can ask questions about us. You can ask you, you know, we can get right into your like direct mail and your database marketing and you can start bringing up your situation. I'll throw this one out here. Uh, this might be like a step after that. Um, so we are perfectly willing to enter into non-disclosure agreements uh, with anybody who wants to talk to us so that their confidentiality confidentiality is maintained, both the information they share with us and like any data they share with us. But, um, you know, uh, you, if you have an NDA, we can, you know, you can send that. We have an NDA. It's mutual. Um, we're, if, you, if you're willing to share some data, we're willing to do some basic analysis. I, I, I'm going to put a little bit of qualifier on there. Uh, so we primarily work with retailers, franchisers, e-tailers that, well, let's talk about retail and franchise or that have brick and mortar retail locations, at least a few dozen up to hundreds, e-tailers, a few hundred thousand customers minimum. Uh, if you fit that mold, we're actually willing to do some basic analysis, kind of pro bono to like demonstrate some uh, subject matter expertise. We can come back with some ideas that, uh, for your consideration to see if you think it'd advance your cause. And also we'll try to help you understand if there's a business case. Uh, so we're probably gonna ask you questions around like transaction value, margin value, response rates, uh, retention rates, lifetime customer value. So we can help you uh, put together a business case calculator that really like assesses whether it makes sense to do this financially, that sort of thing. If you want to do any of that, just reach out to Steve. Um, Steve's my son. He's been doing this a few years, too. You reach out to him, we'll get something set up and uh, try to help you. That's what we do here. We try to help people. Uh, 30 seconds on PrintCom. We are a direct mail company. We help people. We get involved in the strategy stage. We get involved in the data science and analysis. Typically, we can do some creative execution, but that's not our bailiwick. Typically, people are working like with an in-house design department or agency on the creative. Uh, we also do the execution, printing, uh, postal logistics. Like we're really good at helping people save money on postage. So some people bring us in just in the execution stage. Some people bring us in back at strategy and data science. For those of you that are with agencies, like 70% of our business comes from indirects. Like we're really good at protecting client relationships. Uh, we don't try to nose in. Got references we can give you. That's, that's what we do here. We try to help people make money from the direct mail.